This is the module for Biochemistry of Human Milk. My name is Kimberly Prezioso, and I'm a registered dietitian nutritionist and a certified lactation educator. Since you've already heard my bio, we're going to go ahead and get started. I wanted to just start with this quote, the unique feature of human milk is that virtually every component examined plays some extra nutritional role. The elegance of the system is remarkable, the more so we learn about it. Human milk is always changing, and yet it is always perfect. I want to emphasize that this module really only provides a broad overview of the biochemistry of human milk. In some ways, your text goes into greater details, and in other ways, it um, doesn't cover quite as much as this lecture does. What I do want to emphasize again is that if you do have any questions, you can always email me at kprezioso at gmail.com, and I'd be happy to um, talk to you. The composition of human milk is the biologic norm for infant nutrition. Human milk contains many thousands of distinct bioactive molecules that protect against infection and inflammation and contribute to immune maturation, organ development, and healthy microbial colonization. Its varied bioactive factors include cells, anti-infectious and anti-inflammatory agents, growth factors, and prebiotics. Unlike infant formula, which is standardized within a very narrow range of composition, human milk composition is dynamic and varies within a feeding, diurnally, over lactation, and between mothers and populations. Influences on compositional differences of human milk include maternal and environmental factors and the expression and management of milk, for example, its storage and pasteurization. Understanding human milk composition provides an important tool for management of infant feeding, particularly of fragile, high-risk infants, as well as for understanding the potential impact of storage and pasteurization on milk components. Further, we note some bioactive components found in human milk that are being developed and tested for potential medical applications as prophylactic or therapeutic agents. The study of biochemistry of human milk also provides a strong argument against the use of formula. It also plays a strong role in the present and future health of the mother. By the end of the session, the student will be able to characterize changes in milk composition that occur in response to infant growth requirements, explain how milk is a dynamic substance that changes in composition to meet the unique needs of the infant, describe key nutritional and bioactive components of human milk, describe the difference between the milk of a mother whose baby is born premature compared to the milk of a mother whose baby is born term, and compare and contrast commercial infant formula to human milk. In this module, we will be covering components of milk and their function, changes in milk composition, key nutritional and bioactive components of human milk, and comparison of human milk to manufactured milk. There are three stages of lactogenesis, which you will be covering or have already covered. What is important to know for this module is that milk synthesis is controlled by the degree of fullness and emptiness of the breast in lactogenesis 3. Empty breasts attempt to refill quickly at a rate of about 58 ml or around 2 ounces an hour. Full breasts secrete milk slowly at about 11 ml or 0.33 ounces an hour. Babies consume an average of 67% available milk per feed. Therefore, the degree of fullness and emptiness of the breast determines the rate of milk synthesis. As mentioned earlier, one incredible feature of human milk is its specificity. Human breast milk is a complex matrix with a general composition of 87.5% water, 3.8% fat or 50% of total energy, 1% protein, and 7% lactose or carbohydrate source. The fat and lactose respectively provide about 50 and 40% of the total energy of the milk. Together, they contribute around 90% of the calories. The composition of human breast milk is dynamic, as we've mentioned earlier, and changes over time. It adapts itself to the changing needs of the changing child. For instance, during each nursing session, the milk that is expressed first, the foremilk, is thinner with a higher content of lactose, and this satisfies a baby's thirst. 
Following the foremilk, the end milk or the hind milk is creamier with a much higher content of fat for the baby's hunger needs. Variations are also present with the stage of nursing or age of infant. Variations are also present with the maternal diet, maternal health, as well as environmental exposure. And we'll discuss that in detail later. Most of these components vary over time. For example, the fat content of human breast milk can vary with maternal diet and is also positively related to weight gain during pregnancy. Remarkably, it's been observed that a mother's breast milk is almost always adequate in essential nutrients for her term infant's growth and development, even when her own nutrition is inadequate. And this is something that is important to remember when you're speaking with clients. This means you don't need a perfect diet to breastfeed. The food supply over history has never been, and in many parts of the world still is not, stable. This protects the infant against changing conditions and starvation. This does not mean that we shouldn't encourage and support women to do their best to improve the quality of their diet and that of their families. So going through the slide, you can see that we'll be discussing water, proteins, non-protein nitrogen compounds, carbohydrates, fats, fat-soluble vitamins, water-soluble vitamins, cells, minerals, dual-performing constituents, and anti-infectious agents, as well as additional variations. 87.5% of human milk is water. All other components, even the lipids, are dissolved, dispersed, or suspended in water. Even in hot, arid climates, human milk provides all the necessary water for a baby's needs. As we look at the nutrient composition in human milk, note that we will address different nutrients at different levels of depth. Some nutrients will be covered extensively and some only mentioned briefly. For example, I won't be talking about selenium at length, but we will discuss iron and vitamin D um, uh, extensively in terms of looking at their function, content, sources, etc. Human milk contains the smallest amount of protein in the animal kingdom, which is why humans have the slowest rate of growth in the animal kingdom. The milk composition of each animal species is directly related to the growth and development needs of each species. Remember that protein is comprised of chains of amino acids, long chains of hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen atoms. The nitrogen, and in a couple of cases sulfur, um, is what makes it different. Protein is used for growth, development, immunity, as well as for energy. The protein in breast milk provides all of the essential amino acids. Essential meaning those are uh, nutrients that our bodies cannot produce. We have to obtain them from the diet. You'll hear uh, the term essential amino acids as well as essential fatty acids. The protein offered in breast milk is effortlessly digested and easily absorbed into the bloodstream. The distribution of each specific protein is perfectly matched to the growth of the human infant, allowing the young child to use the protein with exceedingly high efficiency. Colostrum has nearly three times more protein than the quantity found in mature human milk. And regardless of the mother's nutritional status or dietary intake, the protein content remains stable. The protein content of milk obtained from mothers who deliver preterm is significantly higher than that of mothers who deliver at term. Protein levels decrease in human milk over the first four to six weeks or more of life regardless of the timing of delivery. For feeding preterm infants, the lower level of total protein and specific amino acids from donor, typically term late lactation milk, alone is limiting and requires additional supplementation. Again, although human milk protein concentration is not affected by maternal diet, protein increases with maternal body weight for height and decreases in mothers producing higher amounts of milk. There have been several studies about the protein concentration of human milk, and on average it seems to be around uh, 1.4 to 1.6 grams per 100 ml during early lactation. Uh, then it decreases to 0.8 to 1.0 grams per 100 ml after 3 to 4 months of lactation, and then it drops even further to 0.7 to 0.8 grams per 100 milliliters after around 6 months. However, again, um, other studies have found that protein um, is significantly higher uh, and some lower. So Again, it is variable. 
Formula manufacturers have tried to replicate human milk in order to mimic its performance. However, formula lacks certain proteins present in human milk, one of which is lactoferrin, which we will cover in detail later and which we've talked about a little bit in previous modules. The animal protein in formulas come from cow's milk, which is tougher, more rubbery, and more difficult to digest than the protein found in human milk. It is interesting to consider that the ongoing attempts by formula companies to revise their formulations highlights the very fact that formulas in their current state are less effective neurologically, nutritionally, or immunologically when compared with human milk. The proteins of human milk are divided into two factions, the whey faction and the casein faction, each of which is comprised of a remarkable array of specific proteins and peptides. The most abundant proteins are casein, alpha-lactalbumin, lactoferrin, secretory immunoglobulin A, lysozyme, and serum albumin. Non-protein nitrogen-containing compounds including urea, uric acid, creatinine, creatine, amino acids, and nucleotides comprise around 25% of human milk nitrogen. Whey is the clear portion of milk protein, and casein is the more solid curd component. If you remember the nursery rhyme, the line curds and whey, well, that's what we're talking about here. Whey is what gives a white, cloudy, or opaque property to milk. It forms soft, flocculent, or fluffy-like, easily digestible curds, and whey is the more easily digestible between the two. Artificial milk's protein, as mentioned earlier, um, are from cows or they're bovine. Uh, cow protein is much less digestible than the casein and whey from human milk. And casein is the dominant protein in cow's milk or bovine milk. The quantity of casein is much lower in human milk as compared to other species. The whey to casein ratio varies with each stage of lactation, going from 90% whey to 10% casein in early lactation, 60 to 40 in mature milk, and 50, 50 or half and half in late lactation. Artificial baby milks differ in whey to casein ratio. For example, Good Start from Nestle has 100% whey to zero casein. Their rationale is that by removing all casein, the formula is easier to digest and more similar to human milk. Although human milk has casein, just it's human casein, not bovine casein. I mentioned earlier that human milk proteins are more digestible than cow milk proteins. Other formulas include Enfamil Lipo with Iron from E. Johnson, which has a 60 to 40% ratio. Abbott Nutrition, uh, the Similac Advance with Iron, has a 48 to 52 ratio. Now, keep in mind that when you look at human milk, the whey to casein ratio varies over time. Again, much more predominant in whey in early lactation, moving to 50-50 in late lactation. The formulas that I just mentioned, for example, the 60-40 ratio or the 48 to 52 ratio, those don't change over time. That combination is present in early lactation, in mature milk, and in late lactation. It doesn't address the needs of the changing infant's gastrointestinal system. While some people may think that it's a good thing that Good Start has all whey. If you look at how the whey to casein ratio is changing over time, you can see that as a baby's GI system is getting more and more mature, the whey to casein ratio is in effect prompting or assisting the baby at learning how to digest more challenging foods as the baby's gastrointestinal system gets older. So it becomes more and more challenging gradually over time as the baby's gastrointestinal system learns to digest more and more difficult proteins. Other proteins found in the whey faction of breast milk are mucins, and mucins are milk fat globule membrane proteins. What those proteins do is they actually surround the lipid globules in milk, and since human milk has a very high concentration of water, that helps the lipid globules in milk be absorbed and digested a little more easily. There are a number of efforts to replicate the components of human milk in order to duplicate its immense physiological advantages. Overly assertive patenting of certain human milk components, followed by the genetic engineering and harvesting of them through questionable means, is commonplace in the attempt to pursue the unobtainable advantages of human milk. 
Let's look specifically at some of the whey proteins. Alpha-lactalbumin, which is the major whey protein, regulates milk synthesis. Its mucins bind pathogens and can kill cancer cells. It also provides calories and is a source of amino acids necessary for protein synthesis. Bovine milk is higher in beta-lactoglobulin, which is not found in human milk. Moving on to lactoferrin. Lactoferrin is an iron-binding protein found in the whey faction. It hinders the growth of iron-dependent pathogens found in the GI, which protects against infections. Lactoferrin competes with the bacteria for the iron. So lactoferrin is involved in iron transport and absorption. It's also an antibacterial uh, because it competes with bacteria to bind iron. It's an essential growth factor for B and T cell lymphocytes. It promotes growth of lactobacilli, the beneficial bacteria. It's produced in mammary epithelial cells, milk ducts, and other regions of the body, speculated to have local as well as systemic defensive properties. It also assists in regulating bone growth. When infants are given iron supplements, lactoferrin may be saturated, thereby rendering its protection weakened. Bacteria such as E. coli can proliferate and flourish. Offering any type of artificial or supplementary feeding can damage lactoferrin's protective effect. We talked earlier about what essential amino acids are, and essential amino acids mean that these need to be obtained from the diet. So there are 19 essential amino acids which are key for human development. Eight of them are present in human milk. Taurine helps develop the brain and retina. It acts in membrane stabilization. It's an inhibitory neurotransmitter, and it improves the fat absorption of preterm infants. It is not found in cow's milk. Tyrosine is actually very low in human breast milk, and phenylalanine is higher in bovine milk. More about the whey proteins. Lysozyme provides antimicrobial protection against different gram-positive bacteria by attacking the wall of the bacteria. Besides breast milk, lysozyme is found in saliva, tears, nasal mucus, and pancreatic juice. It is found in much higher concentration in human milk when compared to bovine milk. Secretory immunoglobulins, which are antibodies, are also a component of whey proteins. We've mentioned these earlier as well. So secretory immunoglobulin A, which is the most critical immunoglobulin because it coats mucosal surfaces to prevent adherence and infiltration by pathogens, also neutralizes bacterial toxins. Maternal secretory immunoglobulin A also stimulates the production of infant secretory immunoglobulin A. There are other components, um, other immunoglobulins such as immunoglobulin G, M, and E present in breast milk. These secretory immunoglobulins are very high during the first days postpartum, and we have a slide later on which will actually show you how they transition over the first few days, but they're high during the first few days as the previously protected in utero baby is now newly exposed to pathogens. Studies have found that this may increase again during the second year of lactation when young toddlers are exploring the world and becoming more exposed to pathogens due to now, again, the extreme hand-to-mouth behavior. The antibodies delivered via maternal milk do not harm the beneficial bacteria that is being produced by the infant's own GI system. They only work against the harmful bacteria and can help prevent inflammation by competing with the other immunoglobulins for antigens. Looking at enzymes, there are more than 400 enzymes that have been discovered present in the whey faction of human milk. They have multiple functions, uh, only a few of which include aiding in digestion, which is especially helpful during the transition period when the baby is adjusting um, from placental to oral feedings. They also are compensatory digestive enzymes, which means they can help offset a negative effect. They also stimulate neonatal development. Some of these enzymes are lipases, which digest fat. They lead to superior fat and mineral absorption. And there are a number listed in your text, and we won't go into those um, here, um, but just know that there are a number of different lipases. And again, the LIP stands for fat, and the ACE stands for enzyme. So when you see anything with an ACE on it, you know that that's considered to be an enzyme. There are also amylases for carbohydrate digestion. There are 
alkaline phosphatase, and peroxidases, which act like hydrogen peroxide and destroy bacteria. And these are just a few of the different enzymes um, that are in human breast milk. There are also hormones in the whey protein faction of breast milk. There's prolactin in milk, which is different than the prolactin derived from maternal serum prolactin. There are prostaglandins, which have anti-inflammatory properties. There's oxytocin, adrenal and ovarian steroids. Uh, there are relaxin and insulin, and there are also thyroid hormones. There are also growth factors in the whey faction of human breast milk. There's epidermal growth factor that aid the GI and other tissue development. There's a nerve growth factor, which may help central nervous system from birth-related injury. And there's also insulin-like growth factor. The non-protein nitrogen compounds, urea, creatine, creatinine, uric acid, glucosamine, and alpha amino nitrogen, as well as nucleic acids, nucleotides, and polyamines, have metabolic and immune functions, and they contribute about 20% of nitrogen. So we're coming up to this module's first test your knowledge slide. A mother asks you if her three-month-old needs supplemental water. What would you tell her? Breast milk satisfies all water requirements. If babies are thirsty, breastfeed. The foremilk of breast milk will supply their water needs. Over time, what happens to the whey to casein ratio in breast milk? Does it increase, decrease, or remain the same? It decreases over time. The weight to casein ratio varies with stage of lactation from 90 to 10 in early lactation, which is super easy to digest, 60 to 40 in mature milk, which is still easy to digest, and 50 to 50 in late lactation, making the GI work a little bit. Carbohydrates are the primary energy supplying nutrients consisting of chains of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. The principal carbohydrate of human milk is the sugar or simple carbohydrate lactose. The concentration of lactose in human milk is the least variable of the macronutrients, but higher concentrations of lactose are found in the milk of mothers producing higher quantities of milk. Interestingly, lactose is unique to mammals. It does not show up anywhere in nature. 40 to 45 to sometimes even 50% of the baby's needs are satisfied from lactose, and 7% of human milk is lactose as compared to 6.5% lactose in horses and kangaroos, and 4 to 5% in cows, goats, and sheep. And again, this just emphasizes the sweetness of human breast milk. The concentration of lactose increases by 10% over the first six months. Lactose is a disaccharide, meaning two monosaccharide sugars are linked together, and it, those two monosaccharides are galactose and glucose, and those are synthesized in the breast. The synthesis of lactose begins at lactogenesis 2, about 30 to 40 hours postpartum. The increase in lactose secreted in the cell draws water by osmosis and affects milk volume. Of all mammals, the human milk is highest in lactose. Our brain is actually the largest in size and our milk is the sweetest. And again, about 7% of lactose is found in human milk, about 7.2 grams per 100 milliliters. Lactose is integral in promoting newborn growth. It also plays a role in enhancing calcium as well as iron absorption and supplies the brain's sole fuel, glucose. It also provides galactose, and you'll remember glucose and galactose are the two monosaccharides that are linked together to form lactose, the disaccharide. And galactose is used in galactolipid for strong brain development, supporting the development of the central nervous system, as well as inhibiting the growth of harmful intestinal pathogens. Because it is digested slowly, lactose provides a steady release of glucose into the bloodstream. Sucrose, the sugar more commonly used in artificial milks that substitute soy for milk protein, is sweeter, but it splits more rapidly. This results in a high peak of glucose in the infant's bloodstream. They've also found that dental caries are higher in infants who are given formula due to sucrose. The absence of lactose in terms of health, growth, and developmental consequences is not clear. 
just to emphasize, it's not just the presence of sucrose in formulas, but it's also the absence of lactose, which is not beneficial to growth. Just to note that primary lactose intolerance is extremely rare, and a high degree of lactose tolerance is generally exhibited by infants of all races. Lactase, and again you remember that the ASC or the ACE at the end of a word indicates that it's an enzyme. So lactase is the enzyme that it's produced prolifically from the ages of around 2.5 to 7 years of age, and it's a brush border intestinal enzyme present by about 24 weeks gestation. You can see the picture on the slide. That's an example of a brush border villi. Those finger-like projections are what absorbs the nutrients in our gastrointestinal system. Lactase is present along the brush border. At 2 to 11 months postpartum, concentration is 2 to 4 times higher than at the newborn stage. And lactase quantity is genetically determined. There are other carbohydrates in human milk, and the other significant carbohydrates are the oligosaccharides or polysaccharides, and those comprise about one gram per deciliter in human milk. And again, that depends on the stage of lactation and maternal genetic factors. The oligosaccharides are among the non-nutritive bioactive factors that I will, dis that I will cover when discussing immunity. Non-nutritive means they don't supply calories. They comprise the third largest solid component in breast milk. They are also some of the most diverse. More than 200 different types have been found. The oligosaccharides stimulate lactobacillus bifidus and other beneficial bacteria by being calorically available. They also prevent bacteria from adhering to GI surfaces and protect against enterotoxins in the gut by binding to bacteria. Oligosaccharides possess anti-infective properties against pathogens in the infant GI tract, such as Salmonella, Listeria, and Campylobacter, and they do that by flooding the infant GI tract with decoys. These decoys bind the pathogens and keep them off of the intestinal wall. Oligosaccharides also have prebiotic capability by having a vital role in the development of a diverse and balanced microbiota, and this is essential for appropriate innate and adaptive immune responses and help colonize up to 90% of the infant biome or healthy GI system. We discussed bifidus factor earlier. Some of the polysaccharides are a component of bifidus. For example, oligosaccharides plus glycopeptides equal bifidus factor. With lactose, lactose bifidus, which occupies the intestine as a beneficial bacteria, is promoted. It grows and subsequently crowds out harmful pathogens. It also produces an acid that inhibits the growth of pathogens. Studies are being conducted to look more closely at the role of fructose in infant growth and development. And as we mentioned earlier, that as a component of lactose, galactose is also present. Fat is the most highly variable macronutrient of milk. The composition of human breast milk, as we've said, is dynamic and changes over time, and it adapts itself to the changing needs of the growing child. Variations are also present with the stage of nursing or age of infant, the maternal diet, maternal health, and pregnancy fat stores. And pregnancy fat stores are actually more easily accessed than other stores. Environmental exposure also plays a role. For example, severe malnourishment may be an issue, but in the vast majority of women, this is not a factor. Fat can vary widely from feeding to feeding, from mother to mother, and it even varies in one 24-hour period. For example, the calories in human milk can fluctuate by as much as 29%. Lipids change during the length of a feeding. Hind milk, which we covered earlier, which is defined as the last milk of a feed, may contain two to three times the concentration of milk fat found in foremilk, which is the initial milk of a feed. Foremilk is thinner and bluish with a higher content of lactose and contains around 1.5 to 2% fat. And this foremilk is what satisfies the baby's thirst. And again, remember that supplemental water is unnecessary during the first six months of life. This is milk that is accumulated in the breast since the last feed, and when an infant sucks and oxytocin is released, that stimulation allows the foremilk residue to wash down the walls of the ducts and ductules. This supports the importance of allowing babies to breastfeed on demand and end the feeding at will. Mothers should not restrict the amount of time baby spends feeding because important fats, protein, and calories are available, even more so at the end of a feeding. 
Hind milk is creamy and white with a much higher content of fat for the baby's needs, as well as to aid in sleep. It has about two to three times the fat content at five to six percent fat. Almost one sixth of a baby's energy can be obtained during minutes 11 to 16 of a feeding. And that's again why it's critical for mothers to be encouraged to let infants remain at the breast and not limit their time. Protein levels tend to fall throughout the feed. The fat content also changes throughout the day. Research has demonstrated that milk fat content is significantly lower in night and morning feedings compared to afternoon or evening feedings. Other studies have found that around 25% of the variation in lipid concentration between mother's milk may be explained by maternal protein intake. The fat content of a mother's diet also comes into play, especially in regards to long-chain polyunsaturated fatty acid. Long-chain polyunsaturated fatty acids are transferred from mother to baby in the third trimester through the placenta and to infants through breast milk after birth. During the last trimester and neonatal period, brain tissue is rapidly synthesized. Cell differentiation and development of active synapses in the brain need specific requirements of specific essential fatty acids. And you'll remember that essential fatty acids mean that we have to obtain them for food. We cannot make them efficiently on our own. One study has showed that the fat content and the percentage of all polyunsaturated fatty acids in breast milk increased significantly between the sixth week and sixth month of lactation. There is a lot of research being conducted right now on the role of essential fatty acids in human breast milk, and especially in the area of maternal dietary influences, as well as in preterm birth. We've already discussed that in the case of a premature birth, the transmission of these fatty acids is interrupted from the placenta to the fetus during, again, that critical last trimester. Studies have showed that decreased postnatal essential fatty acid blood levels in preterm infants are associated with neonatal morbidities or death. Therefore, after birth, the preterm infant is dependent on an adequate diet for sufficient fatty acid levels and may need supplementation. Visual acuity, visual attention, and cognitive development are improved in the addition of essential fatty acids to preterm infant formulas when compared to infants not receiving supplementation. When breastfed and formula fit infants are compared, there's enhanced development of visual function, improved retinal function, and improved visibility visual acuity in breastfed infants due to the long-chain polyunsaturated fatty acids. That is one reason why formula companies are aggressively pursuing the inclusion of these in formula. Other studies demonstrate an improvement in visual attention, problem solving, and global development. Even more studies exhibit the increase in developmental scores at a year of age when compared with infants that are breastfed six months or longer. That is attributed to either fat-contributing energy, brain composition, or both. Research has examined the association between maternal characteristics and the composition of human milk macronutrients and found that after four months postpartum, the macronutrient concentrations of human milk are associated with one or more of the following factors. Maternal body weight for height, protein intake, parity, return of menstruation, and nursing frequency. This study also found that mothers who produce higher quantities of milk tend to have lower milk concentrations of fat and protein but higher concentrations of lactose. We've also discussed the effect that breast fullness as well as emptiness has to fat content. As mentioned earlier, fat levels rise significantly in the second year of lactation, adding yet another evolutionary layer to human milk. Even the age of the mother may play a role in the fat content of colostrum. Women who are 35 years of age or older may contribute more fat. Now this may be due to greater fat synthesis and transfer to maternal milk, lower water content, or some combination of both. In any case, this may be welcoming information to older mothers, I'm putting the word older in, you know, verbal quotes, um, as generally it becomes less and less easy to lose weight as years pass. So what is the composition of fat? The fat content of mature milk is 41.1 grams per liter with a range of 22.3 to 61.6 grams per liter. This is independent of breastfeeding frequency and is directly related to relative fullness or emptiness of the breast. Again, as a breast empties during an individual feed and or over the day, the proportion of fat increases. 70% of the fat variation in human milk can be attributed to this factor. 
An empty breast may have a greater fat content. A fuller breast may have less. The ratio of saturated to unsaturated fatty acids are fairly stable at 42% saturated and 57% unsaturated. The levels of some essential fatty acids in milk are decreased with tobacco use. Lipases, again these are enzymes which aid in fat digestion, break down long chain fatty acids. Free fatty acids are pathogenic. They defend against bacteria, parasites, and can inactivate viruses. 98% of lipids are enclosed in globules, ensuring less clumping and greater efficiency. Triglycerides predominate in human milk over short-chain fatty acids, long-chain fatty acids, and cholesterol. Lipases break down triglycerides into free fatty acids. There are also phospholipids and sterols included in the fat faction of milk. So the additional functions of fat are flavor and satiety to breast milk, growth regulation, inflammatory responses, immune function, and they have a role in the development of motor systems. Now, numerous studies provide support that early exposure to human milk may be linked to lower blood cholesterol concentrations in adult life. And cholesterol has distinctive metabolic effects. It plays an essential role in all membranes and is a vital component of brain tissue, aiding the development of the myelin sheath, which is involved in nerve conduction. Breastfed babies typically have a higher cholesterol level than formula-fed infants. What is the primary carbohydrate in breast milk, and what are three of its benefits? Lactose is the primary carbohydrate in breast milk. The six benefits that I've included uh, mean that lactose contributes to humans having the largest brain size, Human milk is the sweetest of all mammal milks. Lactose enhances calcium as well as iron absorption. Lactose helps supply the brain's sole fuel, which is glucose. Lactose inhibits the growth of harmful intestinal pathogens, and lactose is also digested slowly. Name three ways that fat content varies in breast milk. Fat content varies in the length of feeding, fore milk versus hind milk. There are daily changes to fat content, uh, morning versus afternoon versus evening versus night fat content changes. There are fat content changes in terms of the dietary intake of the mom. The length of breastfeeding over days, weeks, months, and years, the fat content changes. The fat content changes when a breast is full versus when it's emptied. Fat content varies according to the length of time between feedings as well as the age of the mother. Human breast milk contains ample quantities of most vitamins to support normal infant growth and development with the exception of vitamins D and K and B12. Vitamin A and E are present in adequate amounts and vitamin A aids in retinal development and protects against infection. Vitamin E functions as an antioxidant and protects red blood cells against hemolysis or the rupture of red blood cells. Let's look at vitamin D in a bit more detail. Besides its role in skeletal formation, there has been much discovered recently about the contribution of vitamin D or its deficiency to cancer, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, hypertension, and autoimmune diseases. There are also metabolic disorders, infectious diseases, and neurologic conditions that have been linked to a vitamin D deficiency. There have been reports from the Middle East, North Africa, Canada, Australia, England, and even the United States of deficiency and its extreme uh, symptom or disease rickets. Sunlight exposure and vitamin D supplementation are recommended for the breastfed infant. Formula-fed infants often have higher serum concentration of vitamin D metabolites than breastfed infants. So the sunshine vitamin, vitamin D, is a steroid hormone that is naturally present in very few foods, added to others, and is available as a dietary supplement. It's also manufactured endogenously when ultraviolet rays from sunlight strike the skin and trigger vitamin D synthesis. Vitamin D synthesis from the sun is dependent on season, time of day, location, altitude, air pollution, skin pigmentation, sunscreen use, filter, and aging. Vitamin D can be found in both the water and fat-soluble portions of human milk. Maternal supplementation with 400 to 2,000 international units of vitamin D a day can increase the levels of vitamin D in breast milk. However, only a higher dose, around 2,000 international units, can 
achieve acceptable infant levels. Normal vitamin D stores present at birth are depleted within eight weeks. Infants who are exclusively breastfeeding receive below the minimum recommended intake of vitamin D. These infants are at risk for vitamin D deficiency, which can lead to inadequate bone mineralization and conditions such as hypocalcemia, which can lead to rickets. The symptoms include abnormal bone growth, muscle pain, and weakness. Those at highest risk for deficiency include those with dark pigmented skin, those living in the Northern Hemisphere, those with minimal sunlight exposure, those that live in inner cities, and infants, and specifically Hispanic male infants, formula-fed infants, and African-American infants. Vitamin K is essential to the protein involved in blood coagulation. However, only limited amounts of vitamin K are transferred from the placenta to the fetus. There is a higher concentration in colostrum than in mature milk, and later it is synthesized in the infant's GI system. Fetal stores of vitamin K are usually sufficient to hold them over until they begin their own production, but after birth, vitamin K supplementation is recommended to prevent hemorrhagic disease. Hemorrhagic disease symptoms include convulsions, feeding intolerance, poor sucking, irritability, and pallor. Routinely, infants are administered an oral dose or given an intramuscular injection, which is the more common dose in the U.S. A mother's diet can influence infant vitamin K availability. Increasing the mother's intake of vitamin K to greater than one milligram a day during the final weeks of pregnancy can reduce the risk of this disease. Taken during lactation, additional dietary or supplemental vitamin K increased breast milk concentration as well as infant plasma. Water-soluble vitamin levels vary with state of lactation, maternal intake, and if delivery takes place prematurely, they need to be obtained via the maternal diet. These include thiamine, riboflavin, niacin, panathetic acid, biotin, folate, vitamin B6, vitamin D B12, vitamin C, inositol, and choline. And I should mention that inositol is a vitamin-like substance found in many plants and animals. It is a sugar alcohol with half the sweetness of sucrose, table sugar. It has a number of functions and has a role in the secondary messengering in the signal transduction pathway. Inositol is involved in the central nervous system. Choline is similar to a B vitamin. It's an essential component of the human body. It's used in many chemical reactions in the body and seems to be important in the nervous system. It also has a number of other roles. In asthma, choline might help decrease swelling and inflammation. It can be made in the liver. It's found in foods such as liver, muscle, meats, fish, nuts, beans, peas, spinach, wheat germ, and eggs. Human milk has a low percentage of minerals, which is ideal for not overloading the infant's immature kidneys. Minerals are attached to protein in human milk and are therefore more bioavailable. This is another example of the perfect balance of human milk nutrients and demonstrates that human milk is the ideal food for human infants. Numerous factors affect the levels of minerals in human milk. During pregnancy, so the list there of minerals that are available in human milk, um, just to cover calcium in a little bit more detail, human milk calcium is more bioavailable than bovine calcium. The bovine ratio of phosphorus to calcium can also hinder calcium absorption, which can explain the increased incidence of neonatal hypocalcemia in artificial milk feeders. Dehydration is also more likely during bouts of hot weather or GI upset, for example diarrhea, due to the higher mineral content. Artificial milk's greater solute load may lead to additional water requirements resulting in a thirsty baby. A thirsty baby may act like a hungry baby and parents who misjudge the signal may feed the baby artificial milk just exacerbating the situation. Breastfed babies need no additional water as we've discussed earlier, even those in dry, hot, arid climates. There is little waste to flush out of the kidneys as breast milk is more completely metabolized. A breastfed infant's thirst will be satisfied with supplementary breastfeedings. These breastfeeding sessions may only last for a couple of minutes until the infant's thirst is satisfied and moms again should be encouraged that at times infants will breastfeed for short periods of time if all they're doing is breastfeeding to satisfy thirst. There are other trace elements such as copper, chromium, and cobalt present in human breast milk. There's also iron, iodine, fluoride, zinc, manganese, and selenium. Silicon, aluminum, and titanium are also among the multitude of trace minerals in human milk 
and all of these, again, are ongoingly being studied to determine their full contribution and significance. We do know that zinc deficiency during infancy can cause failure to thrive in skin lesions. Again, for the purposes of this course, we won't go into great detail uh, about most of these trace elements, just a few. Iron is a mineral that is found in many proteins and enzymes that the body requires in order to stay healthy. Most of the iron in our bodies is found inside hemoglobin, the iron-containing pigment in red blood cells that carries oxygen from the lungs to the body. Iron is an essential part of hemoglobin as well as myoglobin. Myoglobin is a protein that provides oxygen to muscles. Iron is also crucial for growth, development, normal cellular functioning, and synthesis of some hormones and connective tissue. Hemoglobin transports oxygen from the lungs to all of the tissues and organs in the body. If there isn't enough iron in the blood, the amount of hemoglobin in the blood also decreases. This can reduce the oxygen supply to cells and organs. Low levels of iron lead to iron deficiency and can then lead to iron deficiency anemia. Women have multiple prenatal blood tests. Some of those include hemoglobin or hematocrit. Hematocrit test measures the percentage of red blood cells in a sample of blood. If these levels are low, serum iron levels are also measured. If iron deficiency anemia is detected early on, supplemental treatment can begin using iron supplements as well as dietary adjustments. At the start and towards the end of pregnancy, hemoglobin levels above 11 grams per deciliter are regarded as normal. Between three and six months of pregnancy, a small decline to 10.5 grams per deciliter is also considered to be within normal limits. During pregnancy, healthy, non-anemic women offer their iron via the placenta to their unborn child. They also store sufficient iron stores to provide her baby via human milk ample iron for the first several months, again if they are healthy and non-anemic. The iron stores of infants are not depleted until they are four to six months of age or even later. Although the iron delivered through breast milk is in small amounts, it is satisfactory through four months for normal, healthy term infants. Standard supplementation of iron may have a negative effect on breastfed infants as lactoferrin loses its ability to inhibit the growth of bacteria when it's saturated with exogenous iron. Iron status improves when infants, in combination with human milk, begin eating iron-rich foods. Full-term healthy babies receive enough iron from their mothers in the third trimester of pregnancy to last for the first four months of life. At birth, a healthy infant's hemoglobin level is high at around 18 to 20 milligrams per deciliter. As the weeks and months pass, hemoglobin drops rapidly. By four months of age, infant hemoglobin is between 10.2 to 15 grams per deciliter. It also transitions from fetal to adult form. The adult hemoglobin is a much more efficient transporter than fetal hemoglobin, so even though the iron levels have plunged, the efficiency rises. Human milk contains little iron, although it is highly bioavailable. Even still, currently the AAP recommends some supplementation. For infants who are exclusively breastfed, they consider them to be at increased risk of iron deficiency after four months of age. The AAP recommends giving breastfed infants one milligram per kilogram a day of a liquid iron supplement until iron-containing solid foods are introduced at about six months of age. When solid foods are added to the baby's diet, they recommend to continue breastfeeding until at least 12 months. For babies who are partially breastfed, the iron recommendation remains the same as that for fully breastfed infants if more than half of the daily feedings are from human milk and the child is not receiving iron-containing complementary foods. For formula-fed infants, it is recommended that an iron-fortified formula containing 4 to 12 milligrams of iron be used from birth through the entire first year of life. Premature babies have fewer iron stores, so they often need additional iron beyond what they receive from breast milk or formula. Looking at iron a little more closely, there are two forms of iron. There's heme iron, which is found in meat, chicken, seafood, turkey, pork, and eggs. And there's the non-heme form that's found in plants. And we covered um, iron in the basic nutrition and nutrition education module in greater depth. The takeaway from this slide is that the heme iron is more, is more readily bioavailable and heme iron actually helps non-heme iron be absorbed more efficiently and more quickly. Vitamin C enhances iron absorption. So does lactose. Calcium suppresses iron absorption. 
Many times in my experience as a prenatal or pediatric dietitian, I have found that it may not be that children or grown-ups take little iron or don't take enough iron, but that they have so much milk or milk products in their diet that the calcium really suppresses the iron intake. And so calcium intake can be a huge factor when looking at iron deficiency anemia. One of the things to make sure of is emphasizing that although calcium is a very important nutrient, excessive calcium can be detrimental when it comes to suppressing the absorption of iron. Too much calcium can lead to iron deficiency anemia. What are two components of breast milk that assist with iron absorption? Lactose and vitamin C assist with iron absorption. Also remember that the heme form of iron also helps iron absorption as well. Who is at a higher risk for iron deficiency anemia? Prenatal individuals who are at higher risk for anemia include those with a multiple pregnancy, those with a short interval between pregnancies, those who experience excessive vomiting due to morning sickness, pregnant teens, and those with a poor dietary intake of iron. The infants that are at higher risk for anemia include preterm infants and those with a low birth weight. This slide highlights all of the constituents in human milk that have multiple functions. We've talked about most of these before and we'll be covering some of these in a few minutes. In the United States, approximately 12% of infants are born preterm prior to 37 weeks gestation. Premature infants are a heterogeneous group with widely differing needs for nutrition and immune protection with risk of growth failure, developmental delays, necrotizing enterocolitis, and late onset infections increasing with decreasing gestational age and birth weight. Human milk from women delivering prematurely has more protein and higher levels of many bioactive molecules compared to milk from women delivering at term. Human milk must be fortified for small, premature infants to achieve adequate growth. A mother's own milk improves growth and neurodevelopment and decreases the risk of necrotizing enterocolitis and late-onset sepsis and should therefore be the primary enteral diet of premature infants. Donor milk is a valuable resource for premature infants whose mothers are unable to provide an adequate supply of milk, but presents significant challenges including the need for pasteurization, nutritional and biochemical deficiencies, and limited supply. Preterm milk is higher in protein, fat, sodium, chloride, and free amino acids. It's lower in lactose. Fatty acids are variable according to inner uterine levels and profiles. Term babies can convert long chain polyunsaturated fatty acids into docosahexaenoic acid as well as ARA, arachidonic acid, while preterms cannot. However, preterm breast milk does have a higher fatty acid content than term birth milk. In preterm birth, the transmission of these fatty acids, DHA and ARA, are interrupted. They travel from the placenta to the fetus during that critical last trimester. A preterm birth interrupts the supply. Studies show that decreased postnatal docosohexanoic acid and arachidonic acid blood levels in premature infants are associated with neonatal morbidities. Thus, after birth, the preterm infant is dependent on an adequate supply from the mom's diet for sufficient fatty acid levels. Adding DHA and AA to preterm infant formulas led to initial beneficial effects on visual acuity or sharpness, visual attention, and cognitive development compared with infants receiving no supplementation. Growth is probably the biggest concern in providing human milk to premature babies. Term infants undergo rapid growth in the third trimester of pregnancy. Term infants undergo rapid growth in the third trimester of pregnancy and receive nutrition through the placenta and through swallowed amniotic fluid. They have no need to expend calories for temperature regulation or respiration. Premature infants miss out on much or all of the third trimester and thus have higher nutritional requirements on a per kilogram basis than term infants. Human milk was designed to nourish the term infant who can tolerate large fluid volumes, whereas premature infants are less tolerant of high fluid volumes. 
For these reasons, human milk is generally fortified for premature infants with a birth weight of less than 1,500 grams. Human milk fortifier powders were developed from bovine milk to supplement key nutrients with particular emphasis on protein, calcium, phosphorus, and vitamin D. Fortification of human milk leads to improved growth and weight, length, and head circumference. However, improvements in bone mineralization and neurodevelopmental outcomes are unclear. Recent studies suggest that higher protein intake is beneficial for premature infants. As we have discussed, there is large variation in the energy and fat content of human milk between mothers, over time in a given mother, between foremilk and hind milk, etc. Protein content decreases over time of lactation and is likely to be much lower in donor human milk than milk from mothers delivering prematurely. Many current NICU practices are based on the assumption that human milk has approximately 0.67 kcals per milliliter with a stable protein content. Protein intake from standard fortification is significantly lower than actual protein intake, and therefore these observations have led to clinical trials of individualized fortification, that is, adjusting the amount of added protein based on actual measurements of either milk samples or based on lab values. Both methods have led to increased protein intake as well as improved growth. A recent trial of a human milk fortifier with higher protein content demonstrated increased growth and fewer infants with weight below the 10th percentile. Use of commercial human milk fortifiers, however, is not without complications, but it is uh, beyond the scope of this lecture. When parental milk is unavailable, pasteurized donor milk is recommended for preterm infants. During pasteurization, a heat treatment to destroy pathogens, some of the bioactive benefits tend to be reduced, such as those benefits from secretory immunoglobulin A and lysozyme. There are still improved outcomes when compared to formula use in the hospital and after discharge. What is usually added to preterm breast milk and why? In premature birth, the transmission of the fatty acids DHA and ARA are interrupted. They travel from the placenta to the fetus during that last critical trimester. After birth, the preterm infant is dependent on an adequate diet for sufficient fatty acid levels. Adding DHA and AA to preterm breast milk leads to initial beneficial effects on visual acuity or sharpness, visual attention, and cognitive development compared with infants receiving no supplementation. Explain why donor breast milk is pasteurized and what are the consequences. Donor breast milk is pasteurized for safety, for health concerns. During pasteurization, a heat treatment to destroy potential donor pathogens, some of the bioactive benefits are reduced, including secretory immunoglobulin A and lysozyme. There are still improved outcomes when compared to formula use in the hospital and after discharge. So let's look at colostrum. Colostrum is the residual or remaining combination of materials present in the mammary glands and ducts. Its manufacture begins at approximately 120 days gestation. A few days after birth, it mixes with the newly formed milk. Colostrum is often secreted prenatally, and this is what leaks during pregnancy, and then it's secreted for several days after birth. Its characteristically high protein composition is complementary to the infant's initial rapid growth. It is generally thought of as a baby's first immunization. Colostrum secretions begin with lactogenesis 1 at around week 16 during gestation. Colostrum is a high concentrated, high density, thick, gel-like, yellow colored pre-milk and its yellow color is due to beta carotene. It is semi-transparent and even sticky. The swift increase in milk volume parallels a newborn's increasing stomach capacity. Colostrum contains water, protein, fat, carbohydrates in the form of lactose, minerals, and many vitamins. It's higher in protein, fat-soluble vitamins, and certain minerals such as sodium, potassium, zinc, and chloride. And it does contain less fat and lactose than mature milk. Colostrum provides the most advantageous foundation for a healthy gastrointestinal system. Humans have an extensive bacterial ecosystem or biome residing in their GI tracts. This ecosystem is designed to metabolize food and supply us with energy and nutrients. 
As a baby's GI system is relatively sterile or empty of microorganisms, the first microorganisms that enter into their GI system must be beneficial bacteria. In addition, the long-term health and well-being of the individual depends to a large extent on the health and well-being of their GI. Multiple conditions and disease states, ranging from inflammation, motility issues, cancers, liver disease, malabsorption, etc., are reliant on the status of their GI biome. The first few days are significant, and offering human milk with beneficial bacteria is key to getting the best start to lifelong wellness. Immunologically, colostrum also contains white blood cells, immunoglobulins, lymphocytes, and lysosomes. Later in the module, we'll cover immunity more extensively. Colostrum has important growth factors. It's a natural lubricant, and because of its lysozyme as well as other properties, it is bactericidal, meaning it again destroys harmful bacteria. Colostrum's primary function is protective, not to provide energy. Colostrum coats the GI wall to prevent adherence of pathogens and promotes gut closure, as well as to prepare the infant's stomach to receive nutrition. Colostrum is comprised of 70% leukocytes as compared to only 10% immature milk. The leukocytes protect against infection and foreign invaders, and they help by closing the GI intestinal wall swiftly in times of penetration by outside pathogens and antigens. An antibody, also known as an immunoglobulin, is a large Y-shaped protein produced mainly by plasma cells, and this is used by the immune system to neutralize pathogens such as harmful, disease-causing bacterial and viruses. We've talked about secretory immunoglobulin A. We mentioned that it's particularly high in the first few days, the first 72 hours post-delivery, to protect from exposure of environmental microorganisms. Biologically active, it's only available via human milk. It is not available in formula, and babies do not produce it until they are around six months of age. Other immunoglobulins or antibodies are also present, IgM and IgG. Even though babies do receive many of their circulating antibodies during pregnancy, the high levels of IgA and other antibodies offer additional and much needed protection. Colostrum supports the colonization of bifidus flora in the GI. Bifidus flora is simply the normal helpful bacteria and additional microbes that facilitate the growth of beneficial bacteria, specifically lactobacillus bifidus. It also assists with the passage of meconium, which is the neonate's first stool. This laxative effect stimulates the infant's bowels to begin eliminating waste efficiently. Expedient excretion of waste is crucial in lowering the rate and severity of jaundice. Now, 90% of cells are white cells. Now, what are white cells? Well, you can see them in literature called WBCs. Um, they're also called leukocytes. They're a central part of the immune system. These cells help fight infections by attacking bacteria, viruses, and germs that invade the body. White blood cells originate in the bone marrow, but circulate throughout the bloodstream. Another type of white blood cell are the lymphocytes. They are also one of the body's main types of immune cells. These consist of B cells and T cells. And again, lysozyme. It, like the other immune factors, protects us from the ever-present danger of bacterial infection. It's a small enzyme, and it specifically strikes at the protective cell walls of bacteria. Bacteria build a very, very tough outer skin, and lysozyme targets what is protecting the harmful bacteria. Colostrum also has a variety of growth factors, one of which is lactoferrin. Lactoferrin, again, is the glycoprotein that assists with the transport of iron. It also has interleukin and epidermal growth factor. Epidermal growth factor, or EGF, stimulates cell growth, proliferation, and differentiation. The function of colostrum is primarily protective. It contributes around 67 calories per deciliter, or around 18.76 calories an ounce. The low quantity of colostrum is actually advantageous. It invites frequent feeding, and that frequent feeding in turn promotes a greater supply. The low quantity, which distresses so many women when they are unprepared, encourages milk production. Let's look at colostrum's low volume a little bit further. Mothers really do need assurance that the quantity of colostrum provided is more than sufficient to provide for baby's needs in most cases. 
and in most cases it is plentiful when compared with the capacity of an infant's stomach. Any addition or substitution to colostrum interferes with immunity and future milk production. This table demonstrates the range of approximate quantity of colostrum per day, the mean per day as well as the range per day. It also shows the capacity of an infant's stomach, which for the majority of infants is much smaller than the amount of colostrum available. The sixth column shows the approximate intake per feed and then the intake per day, further demonstrating that colostrum is generally available in ample amounts to satisfy the needs of the baby. As you can see on day one, the quantity of colostrum produced is only about 50 to 40 mLs. On average per day, it's around 37 mLs. The range per day is from 7 to 122.5 mLs, and that's a huge range. But look at the stomach capacity. 7 mLs is the stomach capacity of a day-old baby. Per feed, they take in about 1.5 mLs, and per day, it's only about 10.2 at the low range to 108.8 at the higher range. Again, you can see how widely variable um, the colostrum quantity is throughout this first week. On day three, you can see that the quantity of colostrum is boosted. It goes from you know, 50 to 40 mLs to 300 to 400 mLs. Per day, there's a, around 408 mLs, and the range per day goes from 98.3 all the way up to 775 mLs. On day three, however, the stomach capacity of a baby is only around 27 mLs. The intake per day is about 78 to 408 mLs. Again, on day three, it clearly shows that the stomach capacity of an infant is much smaller than generally what is available in terms of the colostrum produced. On day five, there's around 500 to 800 mLs of colostrum produced. Again, that's, that's shot up quite a bit. Per day, the mean colostrum is around 705 mLs. The range per day is anywhere from 425.5 to 876 mLs, and the stomach capacity, as you can see, the, you know, the stomach is getting stretched out here, is around 57 mLs. On average, the intake per day is around 129 to 705 mLs. Now, colostrum does have less calories than mature milk. Colostrum is 18.76 calories per ounce, as compared to around 20 for mature milk. As colostrum gives way to transitory then mature milk, an increase in calories, lactose, and fat is seen. As we've talked about earlier, protein decreases, and immunoglobulins also decrease over time. Transitional milk exists from approximately day 5 through day 12. There is an intermediate composition between colostrum and mature milk, while volume continues to increase. Macrophages, as part of white blood cells, continue to rise in concentration. So as you can see from this slide, in colostrum, the calories are around 670 per liter, and in mature milk, it bumps up to 750 per liter. Protein per liter, there are about 32 grams in colostrum. In mature milk, as you can see, it really drops significantly. It goes down to around 9 grams per liter in mature milk. Lactose begins at only about 20 grams per liter, and then it jumps up in mature milk to 35 grams per liter. Fat also increases. It starts off at around 12 grams. Again, these are averages 12 grams per liter, and it jumps up to around 38 per grams in mature milk. So let's look at the immunoglobulins. You can look at the immunoglobulins on day one, and you can see how high immunoglobulin G, M, and A are. As you can see going across the table, that going from day one to day three to day seven, to day 8 through 50, you can see how they are decreasing over time. What is the primary function of colostrum? Protective. It offers immunity to the baby in a variety of forms. Why is the low volume of colostrum beneficial?
the low volume of colostrum is beneficial because it invites frequent feeding, and that frequent feeding in turn promotes a greater supply. The low quantity, which distresses so many women when they are unprepared, actually encourages milk production. Again, managing expectations with your clients will go a long way to ensuring, to ensuring successful breastfeeding. Breast milk generally has a watery appearance. It can appear even more diluted when a mother has a high volume. The color and thickness of a mother's milk vary depending on the factors we have discussed previously, such as time of day, time during feeding, length of feeding, etc. A mother's dietary choices also come into play. I mentioned earlier that breast milk may have a creamy white or a bluish white appearance, depending on whether it was the foremilk or the hind milk. Milk may take on other tints as well. So choosing green foods like broccoli or spinach or using vitamins or iron supplements with certain additives may result in a greenish shade. The milk may appear to have an orange hue if a mother's diet is rich in vitamin A, be it from a supplement or food-based. Black milk can also be caused by a medication called minocycline. Now these shades may be normal. If the milk appears tinged with pink, a mother should investigate further. This might be caused by bleeding at the nipple or deeper in the breast. The dynamic nature of breast milk is evident in its energy supplying function. Colostrum has just 19 calories per ounce at 18.76 kcals an ounce. Early mature milk at around two weeks has around 20 calories an ounce. And mature milk at around four months has around 26 calories an ounce. And just as a side note, calories can either be written as cal or kcal. And the actual term for calories um, are kilocalories, which is why you'll see them noted either way as kcals or cals. Now let's look into the future, into the toddler years. Um, in the second year, human milk is equal to at least one eight ounce cup, or if we're considering the portion sizes that are appropriate to a toddler, two, four ounce cups of milk. Again, this is on average. Some women are gonna feed more and some women are going to feed less. So nutrients that remain stable from year one to year two are protein, lactose, iron, copper, lactoferrin, and secretory immunoglobulin A. Nutrients that increase are fat, meaning energy, lysozymes, and serotonin. And serotonin you've probably heard of, it's an important chemical and neurotransmitter in the human body, and this helps regulate mood and social behavior. It helps regulate appetite and digestion, uh, as well as sleep, memory, and other functions. And this increases uh, in the second year, as we mentioned. Lysozyme, that little enzyme with the important task of protecting us from the ever-present danger of bacterial infection by attacking the protective cell walls of bacteria, increases over time. Now, the nutrients that decrease are zinc and calcium. Now let's look at human milk according to some of the conditions and diseases it offers protection against. One of the most frequent infections of infancy is otitis media, or ear infections. This is a, a nuisance common in childhood, and these ear infections frequently follow a bout of colds and stuffy noses. The middle ear fills with fluid, and eventually that fluid becomes infected, initially causing discomfort and pain. And when I say it's usually in the middle of the night, it's especially in the middle of the night. Recurring ear infections are those that can go untreated can eventually lead to hearing loss. Breastfeeding protects against ear infections in four possible ways. First of all, the many pathogen fighting factors in human milk shield the baby so that stuffed up noses and stuffed up ears are less likely to become infected. Breastfed babies are fed in a more upright position and they're less likely to experience milk backing up through the eustachian tube into their ears. Even if this does occur, Human milk is less irritating to the middle ear than artificial milk. Breastfed babies have fewer or at least less severe colds than formula-fed babies. Less colds, less ear infections. Breastfed babies have fewer respiratory allergies, which allows fluid buildup in the middle ear, which allow bacteria to grow. Breastfeeding exclusively for at least four months is widely recognized as the best protection against otitis media. 
As with other diseases and conditions, the longer a mother breastfeeds, the better the coverage. Additionally, the protection given by human milk lasts. Properties in human milk have prompted the breastfed infant's own immune system to defend itself. On a global scale, diarrheal disease is the second leading cause of death in children under the age of five, and it's responsible for killing around 525,000 children every year. Diarrhea can last several days and can leave the body without the water and salts that are necessary for survival. In the past, for most people, severe dehydration and fluid loss were the main causes of diarrheal deaths. Now, other causes such as septic bacterial infections are likely to account for an increasing proportion of all diarrhea-associated deaths. Children who are malnourished or have impaired immunity, as well as people living with HIV, are most at risk of this life-threatening diarrhea. Now, diarrhea is defined as the passage of three or more loose or liquid stools per day, or more frequent passage than is normal for the individual. Frequent passing of formed stools is not diarrhea, nor is the passing of those loose and pasty stools by breastfed babies. Diarrhea is usually a symptom of an infection in the intestinal tract, which is caused by a variety of bacterial, viral, and parasitic organisms. Infection is spread through the contaminated food or drinking water, or from person to person, as a result of poor hygiene. Besides safe drinking water, use of improved sanitation and hand washing with soap, Breastfeeding is the most simple and cost-effective way to reduce the risk of diarrhea. Human milk significantly increases protection against pathogens that target the GI system and lessens the severity of diarrhea if it occurs. When compared to formula, breastfed infants enjoy drastically higher protection. Hospitalization rates are 72% lower, while morbidity rates are 77% lower. Another way in which the benefits of breast milk protect an infant's vulnerable GI is by promoting the growth of healthful bacteria in the intestines. Intestines are the healthiest when you can keep the right bugs or beneficial bacteria in the bowels. The healthful bifidus bacteria, which I have discussed, enjoy a symbiotic relationship with us. They produce vitamins and other nutrients and keep the harmful bacteria in check. The ample supply of lactose in breast milk helps the growth of lactobacillus bifidus to flourish. Breastfeeding is ideal rehydration therapy as well. Children who are suspected of having traveler's diarrhea should breastfeed more frequently. In this situation, infants or children should not be offered other fluids or foods or formula that replace breastfeeding. Breastfeeding mothers with traveler's diarrhea should continue breastfeeding and increase their own fluid intake. The organism's that cause traveler's diarrhea do not pass through breast milk. So let's look at the immune system. The benefits of breast milk helps protect babies against all kinds of infections, common and not so common. For example, around 1 million white blood cells are hanging out in one drop of human milk. These cells, called macrophages, which literally means big eaters, consume germs or pathogens. That's only one component of a complex protective system. Human infants receive protection from antibodies through the placenta, but these are gradually used up during the first six months. Think of human milk filling in the immunity gap until the baby's own immune system matures and kicks in. Babies who nurse into toddlerhood receive protection from the many immune factors in their mother's milk. Now, the immune system protects the body from infections and diseases, and it's also called the lymphatic system. It's made up of the tissues and organs that produce, store, and carry white blood cells that fight infections and other diseases. This system includes the bone marrow, spleen, tonsils, thymus, lymph nodes, and lymphatic vessels. There are two types of immunity, active and passive. Now, your immune system includes lymph, and that's a clear fluid that travels through the lymphatic system and carries cells that fight infections and other diseases. It also consists of lymph nodes, and these are rounded masses of lymphatic tissue that are surrounded by a capsule of connective tissue. Lymph nodes filter lymph, and they store white blood cells. These are located along the lymphatic vessels. And what are the lymphatic vessels? Well, these are thin tubes that carry lymph and white blood cells through the lymphatic system. They branch like blood vessels into all of the different tissues of the body. 
So continuing on, your immune system also has the thymus, and this is an organ in the chest behind the breastbone. T lymphocytes grow and multiply in the thymus. The spleen is an organ on the left side of the abdomen, and that's near the stomach. It produces some white blood cells, it filters the blood, it stores blood cells and destroys old blood cells. And then that we have the white blood cells, and these are cells made by the bone marrow. They help the body fight infection and other diseases. And as we mentioned earlier, there are many different types of white blood cells. The immune system fights antigens, and antigens are a foreign substance that causes a recognition and then a response in our immune systems. Antigens can be bacteria, viruses, etc. There's a different antigen for every cold you've ever had and every type of flower that's ever made you sneeze. White blood cells patrol the body. When they come across an antigen, they produce an antibody. The antibody binds to the antigen. Each antigen is shaped differently. The immune system has to produce the antibody that fits it precisely. Some antibodies destroy antigens when they bind with them. Others make it easier for white blood cells to destroy the antigen. Breast milk includes extensive factors that offer a baby protection against a wide range of disease and gives lifelong immunities while the bodies are working towards active immunity. The course text has extensive tables that name the immune factor and which pathogen it targets. As human milk protects against infection and inflammation, and early milk is enriched in these immune factors, and these cells help ensure infant survival. So the specific protective components of human milk are uh, so numerous and multifunctional, and science is just beginning to understand their complex functions. Essentially, the cells of human milk transfer living protection and programming. This capability provides broadly powerful protection against pathogens while stimulating development of the infant's own immune system. You'll recognize many of these components because we've you know, been going back and forth. And again, most of the constituents of human milk have multiple, uh, have multiple functions. So you've seen these mentioned earlier in some of the previous functions. So there are the macrophages. Those are the big eaters. They comprise around 90% of cells in mature milk. So they contain secretory immunoglobulin A. Infants are born with immature acquired immunity and rely on maternal antibodies for defense against pathogens. Human milk secretory immunoglobulin A antigen complexes are taken up and processed by intestinal cells, which allow for antigen recognition while maintaining a non-inflammatory environment. And phagocytosis is also present, which is the active destruction of pathogens by the macrophages. Some of the other cells are leukocytes, which we've mentioned extensively before, as well as lymphocytes, which include T and B cells, and those are involved in humoral immunity. There are also epithelial cells, neutrophil granulocytes, chemical mediators, and these actually are secreted by cells in the milk, and injured or inflamed tissue causes more white cells to move into the region to assist in healing and prevent infection. And stem cells are also present. The general methods through which breastfeeding could have an impact on infectious disease are multiple, including promoting mucosal maturation. Uh, the mucosa is a membrane or lining that lines various cavities in the body and covers the surface of internal organs. And so this needs to be healthy in order to function. It also balances the gut microflora. It interferes with the attachment of antigens to epithelial cells. It stimulates neonatal immune systems and limits the exposure to the germs from foreign dietary antigens. A lymphocyte is a type of white blood cell, and we've mentioned lymphocytes before, that is part of the immune system. There are two main types of lymphocytes, B cells and T cells. The B cells produce antibodies that are used to attack invading bacteria, viruses, and toxins. We've covered these before. Immunity to a disease is achieved through the presence of antibodies to that disease in a person's system. Antibodies are proteins produced by B cells to neutralize or destroy toxins or disease-carrying organisms. Antibodies are disease-specific. For example, measles antibody will protect a person who is exposed to measles disease, 
but will have no effect if he or she is exposed to mumps. There are two types of immunity, active and passive. Active immunity results when exposure to a disease organism triggers the immune system to produce antibodies to that disease. Exposure to the disease organism can occur through infection with the actual disease, resulting in natural immunity, or introduction of a killed or weakened form of the disease organism through vaccination, which is vaccination-induced immunity. Either way, if an immune person comes into contact with a disease in the future, their immune system will recognize it and immediately produce the antibodies needed to fight it off. Active immunity is long-lasting and sometimes lifelong. Passive immunity is provided when a person is given antibodies to a disease rather than producing them through his or her own immune system. A baby acquires passive immunity from its mother through the placenta or breast milk. A person can also get passive immunity through antibody-containing blood products such as immune globulin, which may be given when immediate protection from a specific disease is needed. This is the major advantage to passive immunity. Protection is immediate. Whereas, active immunity takes time, usually several weeks, to develop. However, the downside to passive immunity is that it lasts only for a few weeks or months. Only active immunity is long-lasting. So, mom has spent a lifetime building up immunity to diseases that she has fought. At birth, newborns are abruptly exposed to a wide range of pathogens. Once breastfeeding is initiated, the mother passes on protection. She passes on passive immunity via antibodies in her colostrum and ongoingly in mature milk to the baby. She's already transferred some prenatally through her placenta. So when a new microorganism appears on the scene, the mother's immune system prepares an immune response and it is delivered via breast milk. Mothers offer immunity far beyond common colds and yearly flus. As the baby gets older, they begin developing their own immune response or active immunity. One of the most saddening aspects of formula is the complete absence of protection against disease. Research demonstrates higher death rates for infants who are not fed human milk, and it's estimated that 720 to over 900 infant mortalities per year in the United States alone could have been prevented if human milk would have been the milk of choice. Additionally, the longer an infant receives human milk, the greater the immunity conferred. So look at it like this. There are two forms of immunity, innate and adaptive. Innate immunity occurs immediately when circulating immune cells recognize an issue. Adaptive immunity occurs later as it relies on the coordination and expansion of specific adaptive immune cells. Immune memory follows the adaptive response when mature adaptive cells, highly specific to the original pathogen, are reserved or remembered for later use. It is those remembered adaptive immune cells that a mother passes along via the placenta during pregnancy and human milk beginning at birth. These include antibodies. Many a nursing mom can tell the story of how the entire family, mom, dad, siblings, everybody, coming down with the flu and the nursing baby having the mildest case or not even getting sick at all. So we have been talking about the various beneficial factors in human milk that are transferred to the baby. Viruses also pass through to the baby. However, the possible illness that the baby may contract can be targeted by disease-specific antibodies that are also present in the breast milk. In addition, mothers and babies have generally shared the same space, they've shared the same environment, and antibodies in the mother's breast milk are crafted and they're designed for those precise pathogens that they have both experienced. Any time a mother develops an illness, her body produces a fighting response, and included in that response are antibodies passed to the baby. Even vaccinations the mother received during childhood are passed along. Mothers and babies have, obviously they have close contact, and by the time a mother demonstrates symptoms to an illness, chances are that the baby was exposed during the time that she was contagious or pre-symptomatic. The most strategic, and successful option is for moms to continue breastfeeding, so protection via her developing immune response can be transferred to the baby. Any needed medication should be offered to the infant, and mothers who are contagious can continue to breastfeed by using you know, standard sanitation practices like hand washing or, or, or wearing a mask. Rest and following any treatment plan is important for a quick recovery.
Name three ways breast milk provides immunity to an infant. So it can include promoting mucosal maturation, balancing the gastrointestinal microflora, obstructing the attachment of antigens to epithelial cells, stimulating the neonatal immune systems, and limiting exposure to the germs from foreign dietary antigens. A mom calls you. She is sick and is worried about breastfeeding her baby. What would you tell her? Mothers and babies have close contact, and by the time a mother demonstrates symptoms to an illness, chances are that the baby was exposed during the time that she was contagious or pre-symptomatic. The most strategic and successful option is for moms to continue breastfeeding. That way, protection via her developing immune response can be transferred to the baby. Any needed medication should be offered, and mothers who are contagious can continue to breastfeed by using um, standard sanitation practices like thorough hand washing or wearing a mask. And rest and following any treatment plan is important for a quick recovery. Human milk may increase the protective effect of vaccinations. Studies demonstrate a lower immune response in formula-fed infants, possibly because human milk contains antibodies capable of improving infant antibody response. Other researchers believe that there is no such difference, and others consider that human milk antibodies may neutralize the baby's immune response adversely and lower the defensive effect. So overall, um, however, it is generally agreed that lactation offers present and future protection. In today's age, where vaccinations are controversial to some, breast milk is an immunization that was made to order. It's customized and specific to a unique human. While vaccinations are indeed a one-size-fits-all, human milk is perfectly designed to fit a certain infant. There are additional immunological factors in human milk, uh, and breast milk contains numerous um, constituents that assist in a baby's protection from disease. Again, research is strenuous and ongoing to continue learning about all of the protective advantages, uh, and that even includes rigorous studies in epigenics, metabolic programming, and stem cell function. And we've mentioned these before, but again, there are even additional ones over and above um, beyond what we've covered in this module. Again, this field of study is vast and complex, and, you know, a two-hour module on biochemistry of human milk really is just an overview. It's just an introduction. So just quickly to review, the mucins are glycoproteins. They have a high molecular weight, and they're involved in a number of immune functions. Glycoproteins are any class of proteins that have a carbohydrate group attached to their chain. They uh, may also be called a glycopeptide. And again, these involve shielding the epithelium against infection, regulating cell signals, and gene transcription. Some of the serious pathogens that mucins offer protection against include salmonella, E. coli, rotavirus, and HIV. An oligosaccharide is a carbohydrate whose molecules are composed of a small number, often 3 to 10, monosaccharide units. We have discussed them briefly earlier in the module. They are plentiful in breast milk, and they are a key component of bifidus factor that assists in creating a healthy GI microbiome. Lactobacillus bifidus is the principal beneficial microorganism and leads to newborn well-being. It's elevated in colostrum and mature milk. Not easily digested, these oligosaccharides function as prebiotics, meaning they colonize the infant GI. These are the decoys. These are the decoys that prevent harmful microorganisms from binding to receptors. They reduce the risk for all infection, viral, bacterial, and parasitic. They shield the entirety of the GI system, passing into the stool in the urine. They decrease the risk for necrotizing enterocolitis and also provide sialic acid, which is indispensable for brain and cognitive development. As with other customized components of human milk, oligosaccharides vary among moms and over the course of lactation. They help prevent transmission of HIV from moms to their babies, which is why despite an infant's exposure to an HIV-positive mom, the transmission rate remains low. Mothers who enjoy a higher level of oligosaccharides, um, a few in particular, are linked with low transmission. 
oligosaccharides, along with prebiotic status, also enjoy probiotic status. Prebiotics, again, are natural, non-digestive food components that are linked to promoting the growth of helpful bacteria in the GI. They are good bacteria promoters. Now, probiotics are food or supplements housing good bacteria or live microorganisms or culture, just like those naturally found in the GI. These active cultures help change or repopulate intestinal bacteria to balance gut flora. Lactic acid bacteria and bifidobacteria are the most common types of microbes operating as probiotics. So to obtain more probiotics, you can look to fermented dairy foods like yogurt, kefir products, aged cheeses, which contain live cultures. Um, including plenty of non-dairy foods, um, which also have beneficial cultures like kimchi, sauerkraut, miso tempeh, and cultured non-dairy yogurts um, are also a way to include or increase probiotics. Ultimately, prebiotics, or good bacteria promoters, and probiotics, or good bacteria, work together synergistically. In other words, prebiotics are breakfast, lunch, and dinner for probiotics, which restores and can improve GI health. Products that combine these together are called symbiotics. And again, formula companies and researchers continue in their attempts to imitate this human milk advantage. Now, of all of the antiviral defense factors, immunoglobulin A is most likely the most critical. We've mentioned this immunoglobulin a number of times. If you will remember, these are proteins present in the serum and cells of the immune system, and they function as antibodies. This antibody pops up repeatedly when talking about the benefits of human milk. So immunoglobulin A essentially coats the lining of baby's immature intestines, preventing germs from leaking through. Secretory immunoglobulin A also works to prevent food allergies. By covering the intestinal lining like a protective paint, the benefits of breast milk pre prevent molecules of foreign foods from getting into the bloodstream to set up an allergic reaction. Colostrum is especially rich in secretory immunoglobulin A, just at the time when the newborn is first exposed to the outside world and needs protection the most. Colostrum also contains higher amounts of white blood cells and infection-fighting substances than mature milk. So secretory immunoglobulin A, as we mentioned earlier, prevents inflammation. It is also active against encapsulated viruses, rotaviruses, polioviruses, respiratory viruses, um, enteric and respiratory bacteria, as well as intestinal parasites. As you can see, it has a wide range of protection. It does not actually destroy or kill them. The immunoglobulins actually envelop and contain them, rendering them unable to attack or attach to receptor sites. And by not attaching to the receptor sites, or the intruding bacteria or viruses or other pathogens do not invade the GI. It also helps stimulate infant manufacture of secretory immunoglobulin A. White blood cells or macrophages, the big eaters, are abundant in colostrum and mature human milk as previously covered. Leukocytes are one form of white blood cells, a type of immune cell. Most white blood cells are made in the bone marrow and are found in the blood and lymph tissue. White blood cells help the body fight infections and other diseases. Phagocytes, granulocytes, monocytes, and lymphocytes are all white blood cells. Looking closely at a lymphocyte, it's a type of white blood cell that is a part of the immune system. There are two main types of lymphocytes, B cells and T cells. The B cells produce antibodies that are used to attack invading bacteria, viruses, and toxins. The T cells develop from stem cells in the bone marrow and destroy the body's own cells that have themselves been taken over by viruses or have become cancerous. Cell-mediated immunity, a specific defense that targets harmful foreign pathogens, are another function of T cells. The thymus is an organ that is part of the lymphatic system in which T lymphocytes grow, mature, and multiply. The thymus is in the chest behind the breastbone, and again, formula is implicated in suppressing the immune system as babies who receive human milk have larger thymus glands. The newborn's intestinal wall is very vulnerable to invasion by foreign pathogens as they have almost no antibodies in their immature immune system. Human milk offers anti-absorptive protection of the intestinal lining, and that's available through many antibodies, especially secretory immunoglobulin A, uh, defending the surface from bacterial invasion. 
As the infant grows older, the entire GI system, including the wall, matures and becomes more readily able to shield itself. The development of the immune system is aided by zinc as well as long-chain polyunsaturated fatty acids. It takes longer for a baby's GI tract to mature when fed formula, as zinc and long-chain polyunsaturated fatty acids are transmitted via breast milk. Although breast milk does not guarantee freedom from all food allergies, formula drastically increases the incidence of and rate of onset. Human milk is the optimum way to protect an infant's GI system and immune system through maturation, whether or not food allergies are present. Formula-fed infants also experience higher rates of asthma, and allergies cause approximately half of all cases of asthma. Rarely is an infant allergic to the mother's milk. Rarely. However, an infant may demonstrate allergic reactions in response to a food consumed by the mom. Allergens pass through the mother's milk and may cause symptoms such as spitting, vomiting, gas, diarrhea, colicky behavior, or skin rashes. However, one or some of these symptoms does not automatically indicate a reaction to an eaten food. Epigenetics is the study of changes in organisms caused by modification of gene expression rather than alteration of the genetic code itself. It looks at the cellular layer that rests on top of the genome and the mechanism behind how genes are switched on or off. Many of the components of human milk enhance the function of metabolism or how genes are expressed. This field is relatively new and research is ongoing in pursuit of um, all of the different complexities involved in it. Developmental programming, also referred to as fetal origins of adult disease or Barker hypothesis, is the basis for the observation that low birth weight is not only associated with immediate morbidities for the neonate, but also leads to later risk for adult diseases. The theory implies that there are critical time periods during fetal and postnatal development when an individual is sensitive to environmental stressors. During these early periods of plasticity, changes to an individual's metabolism can remain permanent. The adaptations that occur during critical periods of fetal and postnatal development promote survival in an inadequate environment, for example, poor nutrition or growth restriction. And so in these surviving individuals, later in life exposure to nutritional abundance and abundant growth, um, not necessarily healthy growth, but abundant growth can cause metabolic disturbances that promote the development of diseases such as hypertension, obesity, and diabetes. And let's look quickly at stem cells. So stem cells have the remarkable potential to develop into many different cell types in the body during early life and growth. In addition, in many tissues, they survive as a sort of internal repair system, dividing essentially without limit to replenish other cells as long as the person or animal is still alive. When a stem cell divides, each new cell has the potential either to remain a stem cell or become another type of cell with a more specialized function, such as a muscle cell, a red blood cell, or a brain cell. Stem cells are distinguished from other cell types by two important characteristics. First, they are unspecialized cells capable of renewing themselves through cell division, sometimes after long periods of inactivity. Second, under certain physiologic or experimental conditions, they can be induced to become tissue or organ-specific cells with special functions. In some organs, such as the gut or bone marrow, stem cells regularly divide to repair, excuse me, to repair and replace worn out or damaged tissues. In other organs, however, such as the pancreas and the heart, stem cells only divide under special conditions. Until recently, scientists particularly worked with two kinds of stem cells from animals and humans, embryonic stem cells and non-embryonic somatic or adult stem cells. In 2007, researchers discovered stem cells in human milk, and to this day, this continues to be a very stimulating and um, progressive area of study. Investigations of late have found human milk stem cells migrate and assimilate into organs in utero and have importance operationally later in life. 
there is a possibility of mammary stem cells being reprogrammed for varied use, and um, there are ethical considerations involved. Is human milk sterile? Not at all. However, anti-infective agents maintain a low bacterial level for hours. This essentially means that the mother's milk can defeat pathogens in the infant's GI system before they can impact the baby. And recall that there are a number of factors in breast milk that coat the GI tract, making it difficult for invading organisms to invade. I have discussed the potential harm to an infant's GI system extensively, and however, human milk goes way beyond these illnesses. They also serve as protection against certain childhood cancers, as well as a myriad of chronic and autoimmune diseases. They also offer protection to the mom herself, decreasing the risk of premenopausal breast cancer. So we have already discussed um, other childhood illnesses like otitis media and diarrhea, and there are numerous tables listed in your text that contain other protective examples of human milk. These conditions and disease states include everything from alcoholism to schizophrenia, and these supporting studies are listed as well. The benefits of breastfeeding, even in our current limited but growing understanding, surpass artificial baby milk. To consider what future researchers will uncover, not just in the superiority of human milk nutritionally and functionally, but in the extreme weakness and toxicity of formula is sobering. Researchers are interested in human milk and nitrogen compounds top the list. Non-protein nitrogen compounds, beginning with nucleotides, are an essential ingredient to immunity. Nucleotides are critical to numerous physiological functions, including growth, development, and maintenance of the GI and immune systems, and nucleotides are the host defense against pathogenic attacks. Absent in cow's milk and less synthetically added, breast milk again provides the necessary components. Prostaglandins, bile salts, and epidermal growth factor are additional areas in which researchers consider of great consequence to the study of human milk. Why are formula-fed infants more susceptible to allergies and asthma? Formula-fed babies have less beneficial bacteria, they have greater pathogen exposure, and they have more exposure to harder to digest formula. Besides diarrhea and ear infections, what other disease states does breast milk protect infants from? So other disease states that breast milk offers protection from are certain childhood cancers, allergies, asthma, autoimmune disorders, and um, for mom, we should mention premenopausal breast cancer. So there are a number of anti-inflammatory and pharmacologically active components that we haven't um, discussed in this module, but um, that we should at least give mention to, and I believe that your text does cover uh, some of these to a certain extent. There are prostaglandins, ovarian steroids, gonadotropics, somatostatin, prolactin, and insulin. Hormones are special chemical messengers in the body that are created in the endocrine glands, and these messengers control most major bodily functions, from simple basic needs like hunger to complex systems like reproduction and even the emotions and mood. And they are regulatory substances produced in an organism and transported in tissue fluids such as blood to stimulate specific cells or tissues into action. And more and more researchers are discovering and understanding the intricate role that they possess in human milk. To date, over 300 um, peptides have been identified and we'll be looking briefly at the following hormones and their role in infant growth and development. Cholecystokinin or CCK is triggered by an infant's active sac. It is a digestive hormone found in the GI tract and brain, and production of CCK may be why mothers and babies experience a sense of sleepiness and relaxation during breastfeeding. So leptin is one of the hormones directly connected to body fat and obesity. 
leptin, a hormone released from the fat cells located in adipose tissues, sends signals to the hypothalamus in the brain. And this particular har- hormone helps regulate and alter long-term food intake and energy expenditure, not just from one meal to the next, but again, that's long-term. The primary design of leptin is to help the body maintain its weight. Because it comes from fat cells, leptin amounts are directly connected to an individual's amount of body fat. If the individual adds body fat, leptin levels will increase. If an individual lowers body fat, the leptin level will decrease as well. Leptin helps inhibit hunger and regulate energy balance so that the body does not trigger hunger responses when it does not need energy. However, when levels of the hormone fall, which happens when an individual loses weight, the lower levels can trigger substantial increases in appetite and food cravings. This in turn can make weight loss more difficult. It assists in the formation of neural circuits that control food intake energy intake, and weight for adults. In infancy, breast milk may contribute to helping infants regulate current intake as well. Current studies have seen that infants receiving formula have low levels of leptin and higher body mass indexes, or BMI, leading researchers to believe that the absence of leptin in formula feeding may contribute to formula feeding leading to obesity. Ghrelin is central to appetite normalcy and the release of growth hormone. Now, ghrelin is produced in the stomach and small intestine with a little bit of the hormone released in the pancreas and the brain. It's been called the hunger hormone because of its role in controlling appetite, but that is just one of its functions. So it has many roles, but the one that it is most well known for is in the ability to stimulate appetite. It causes an individual to digest more food and store more fat. And in fact, when given artificially to humans, the amount of food intake can increase by 30%. So this hormone plays a role in the hypothalamus, which is the part of the brain that controls the appetite. And it may also act on regions of the brain that control reward processing. So it also plays a role in the pituitary glands function, where ghrelin receptors trigger the stimulation of the hormone. It appears to help control insulin release and plays a protective role in cardiovascular health. This well-rounded hormone has a job in many different bodily systems. Ghrelin is higher in formilk, and triglycerides and leptin are higher in hindmilk, and this may help babies register satiety and self-regulate. As artificial baby milk is unchanging or static through the feeding, there may be a disconnection with or delay in satiety, leading to a lack of self-regulation, which can lead to additional calories. Adiponectin. This hormone, secreted by adipose or fat tissue, is one of the cell signaling proteins found in human milk. It serves to regulate lipid and glucose metabolism, influence infant growth and development, function as an anti-inflammatory, and is inversely related to insulin resistance and fatness. Levels of this hormone decrease in breast milk over time and may possibly play a role in helping uh, premature infants adapt metabolically. It may also assist with normal growth and development. Resistin. So resistin is a protein peptide in breast milk and it's released by fat cells. This Uh, This hormone is still a little bit of a mystery to researchers, but it may have a role in controlling the pace or speed of inner uterine growth. It may also support an infant's metabolic development. Now, obostatin. Newly found, obostatin is another peptide that may control sleep, boost pancreatic performance, and suppress appetite. So I won't even really cover this slide in depth. Um, This is just another slide serving to highlight the many different complexities of um, immunological and nutritional constituents of breast milk. And you can see that there are so many other, um, again, constituents that we just don't have the time to cover in a two-hour introduction to biochemistry of human milk. But There are other peptides that are involved in growth, energy, and maturation in energy homeostasis and diabetes, as well as metabolic pathway regulation and postnatal organ growth and development. 
Other peptides are involved in the appetite and self-regulation of food consumption. And again, just the takeaway from um, these last slides are that, well, almost daily, um, you know, research is published that highlights the remarkable properties of human milk, particularly metabolic programming and obesity. Studies continue to demonstrate the specificity and uniqueness of individual breast milk. So we'll finish this module with a comparison of human milk to manufactured milk. Human milk matches more than 50% of baby's genetic material. Milk from other species and plant-based fluids are genetically different from the human infant. Breast milk has a unique balance of nutrient and other components. It most closely matches milks of species with high maternal investment and frequent feedings. Human milk composition as we've mentioned earlier, is dynamic. It's not static or uniform like artificial baby milk is. It is an evolution. Colostrum evolves to transition milk and then into mature milk. Colostrum in the early weeks is more accurately described as an immune layer that persists throughout the duration of lactation. Bioavailability is low for all other milks. Iron absorption is greater in human milk. Human milk has little residue and low solute load, and nutrients are utilized efficiently. Nutrients serve more than one purpose. Milk from other animals contains deficiencies and or excesses of one or more components, only some of which can be modified for infant consumption. Manufactured milk has 100% foreign proteins, and those are derived from um, ruminant animals such as cows or goats or plants. So formula can also increase the incidence of allergies, and cow's milk protein and soy are known triggers for diabetes in genetically susceptible infants. There can be decreased arousability in formula-fed infants, which has an implication in sudden infant death syndrome, and there may also be compromised heart rhythms. Now, bovine milk is high in phenylalanine, which we mentioned much, much earlier in the module, which can increase the complication of PKU, which is phenylketonuria, which is um, a metabolic disorder, which can lead to developmental delay. Now, soy milk has many bioactive components, including phytoestrogens, aluminum, and magnesium, and research is still being done to see what the possible implications of those are. There are also uh, non-human fats in formula with no capacity to protect the myelin sheath, heal from injury, or help to develop the central nervous system. With formula, there's also an increased risk of multiple sclerosis, altered cholesterol metabolism, and altered vision and cognitive development. There may also be the absence or deficiency of lactose. And lactose, as you'll remember, um, is a, a huge component of breast milk, and it's needed for a number of functions, but especially for the central nervous system and cognitive development. So with manufactured milk, um, there's also a lack of regulation, and some components and special formulas are unregulated, and there may be recalls for mistakes and um, even contamination at times. Powdered formulas are not sterile, and there may be manufacturing errors. There's also the experimental nature of a product, including additions of um, certain uh, fatty acids like DHA and AA, and those are manufactured sources, and there's no real evidence to support the efficacy or safety of manufactured DHA and AA versus those from human milk. Formula feeding is also indicated in suboptimal growth patterns. Formula-fed children are fatter per length with smaller heads. They meet head circumference and other developmental milestones at later dates. There's an increased incidence of short-term illness, as well as an increased incidence of long-term and chronic illness. And there's also altered metabolism for women who do not lactate. So when you look at calories, um, usually they are fairly similar at around 20 calories an ounce, or about 60 to 70 calories per milliliter. And those are based on an average infant intake of about 750 milliliters a day. Now, this is a smaller range than the highly variable human milk. Um, the protein content of certain formulas may be higher depending on the source of protein, uh, which is usually based on the milk of cows or other animals or soy. As mentioned earlier, 
Formula is more difficult for an infant to digest, primarily because of the higher levels of casein. Most formulas are modified to increase the weight to casein ratio. And while that may seem like that's a good thing, like that's a beneficial thing, remember that an infant's GI system is supposed to mature. It's supposed to be challenged in anticipation of the more difficult proteins that it's going to be um, you know, eating as it ages. Soy-based formulas are often used when infants are allergic to cow's milk, although frequently that doesn't solve the problem because many babies who are allergic to cow's milk are also allergic to soy. And soy formulas are also more commonly made without lactose, which again, as we mentioned, lactose is an integral component for so many reasons um, of human breast milk. And even the lipids that are... Um, put in manufactured milk. The lipids are often vegetable oils, and in the past, uh, they were even using trans fatty acids. And as we mentioned earlier, even though we have essential fatty acids and um, polyunsaturated fatty acids and long chain fatty acids in, in manufactured milk, again, these are manufactured. They're not um, human based. And so sometimes even though it may seem like, well, we're putting in essential fatty acids, this is a good thing. There really isn't a way of knowing yet if that's actually beneficial due to um, the fact that it was manufactured and not innate. So finally, let's look at hydrolyzed formulas. So hydrolyzed formulas are specialized formulas and they do offer complete nutrition for infants who can't digest intact cow's milk protein. They also help infants who are allergic to intact cow's milk protein. If an infant is allergic to cow's milk protein, these formulas will not be beneficial. And lactose-free formulas do not assist with a protein allergy, only with offering an alternative to lactose. But again, um, a lactose-free formula, it is very rare, uh, for, it's very rare for infants to um, be lactose intolerant. The bottom line with comparing human milk to manufactured milk is that 50 years of technology will never beat a human breast. And this is just a quick summary of formula as compared to breast milk. And you can see all of the different additions that are being put in formula. Probiotics are added, prebiotics, minerals, vitamins, fats, DHA and AA or ARA, carbohydrates, protein, and water. And so again, those are included. So it looks pretty complete. But then when you look over at human milk, um, the antibodies that are present, the anti-cancers, the growth factors, the enzymes, the disease-fighting stem cells, the hormones, the antivirus um, constituents, the anti-allergy constituents, the anti-parasitics, with, again, probiotics, prebiotics, minerals, vitamins, fats, and especially the specific um, essential fatty acids from human milk, um, and again, the DHAs and ARAs, along with the carbohydrates and protein and water, um, there really is there really is no comparison. Name three ways formula is different from breast milk. So three ways that formula is different from breast milk include genetic matching, the dynamic nature of breast milk, the evolutionary nature of breast milk, the bioavailability of breast milk constituents, the residue and low solute load of breast milk, the efficiency of breast milk, and just the nutrient composition of breast milk. Why do some moms believe that their babies do not get full or satisfied on breast milk? Breast milk is more easily digested and therefore more quickly digested. And what some moms may view as satisfying or filling is actually the baby's digestive system working much harder and much longer to digest the formula. So in five years, I am certain that we will be amazed at what we did not know about human milk and breastfeeding in 2018. The impressiveness of human milk, as well as the consequences of artificial milk, are far-reaching and expanding as research daily uncovers the unfolding beauty and power of human milk. As future lactation consultants, asserting that breastfeeding is not a lifestyle decision, but an investment in health is key. A lack of breastfeeding support is one of the chief reasons why women do not breastfeed. 
This is a great quote by Dr. Ruth Peterson. Breastfeeding provides unmatched health benefits for babies and mothers. It is the clinical gold standard for infant feeding and nutrition, with breast milk uniquely tailored to meet the health needs of a growing baby. We must do more to create supportive and safe environments for mothers who choose to breastfeed. In the slides following, I have included a number, again, you've heard this before, of quality, reliable resources for you to refer to, and from government agencies, journals, universities, consumer groups, professional organizations, and volunteer groups, there are many, many places to obtain dependable information. And pregnancy and lactation, again, are milestones in a woman's life. And she may be more receptive to nutrition education in these instances. So being a positive influencer by being ready with sound nutrition suggestions will benefit mom, baby, the entire family, the community, and hopefully for generations to come.